No, that's more information that I want you to have because I don't want to tell you trying to stalk me on the internet or something like that or stealing my identity or that kind of thing. So, Did um, your goats ever have babies? Not yet. What the heck, man? Exactly. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, while well, I'm recording, I'm sorry if it goes to a whole way to But if you had kids, whether you're a goat, a horse, a human, if you had kids, the, the first time you see a, a, a woman describing her first kid, her belly lit until like the eighth or ninth month, and then boom, and she looks like a basketball. But once, so the, the, the size really doesn't, the belly doesn't really happen until the end. Yeah. But once all that stretching has happened first time, it's a whole lot easier for that stretching to happen in time two, three, four, in the future. So a lot of times when pregnancy number two comes along, boom, bellies, a whole lot more prominent, faster, earlier in life cycle. And in this case, the goat is a little bit older, and so she's had kids before, so you know, she may have only been like one month long or something like that. And then when it does settle, you know, it's hard to believe we've really only had his goats a little over two months now. It seems like we've had them for a while. So, so technically, she may not have a sucker to go on. Yes, or maybe they won't drop out of the puddle at all. Right. Well, I mean, it's still raining, but yes. <laughs> I'm the idiot. I told you. I told you all I was going to rewire my house. I did that Friday, all day, and part of the day Saturday because it took longer than I should have. I'm not going to go into those details, but I'm like, I'm out there hooking up the mains where the electricity comes from the pole, from the meter, so those wires are still alive, and I'm trying to work in this box. It's like that big, big, huge, thick, stiff wires and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I thought it was going to stop raining, and it didn't. And I'm like, I've got to hook this up. So I'm out there just, just like half drowning out there standing in the living so there's that or whatever and I'm like I ended up wiping out my shoulders like messed up and because I'm working overhead just have my wires the I planned on them being able to reach one breaker box before I put the two breaker boxes and once I had to go there were long enough and now we can let Sam go but uh, anyway so other nightmare so don't freak out but I'm gonna probably be standing on the other side of the class for the bulk of the day doing the panel white things at the which I'm usually good about moving around, but just for like two years, the microphone sat here, so I just sort of got used to staying in here and here, the microphones that are recording, but now I'm free to walk around and I just don't do it. So it's all Sam's fault. So, okay. So we've been stalling, waiting on you, children. And I can't believe that I'm showing video. That was the same. So, um, we've been talking about inflation. Did we not? Yeah, we went over these. We looked briefly looked at inflation rates a little bit. Okay. So, um, um, that is clearly quickly. Yes. Yes. Just. Just. That's me. I haven't found any of in a while. Anyway. Okay. So, uh, okay. Um, Inflation, we kind of talk about it. We talked about the human costs of, oh, that's the human cost of unemployment, you know, being out of work, the psychological, whatever. Well, inflation kind of brings some of the same things to some people. Uh, and I sort of talk about some of this. People on fixed incomes, well, when prices change, it's going to be redistributing the national income, C plus I plus V plus X. As inflation's coming around, whatever prices of things that you and I buy are going up, and the prices of things grandma's buying is going down, well, she's better off, we're worse off. So our money would as it go as far, her money goes farther. The businesses that she buys from are being maybe making less money. The businesses that we're buying from are being more successful. Inflation hurts people on fixed incomes, people whose pay doesn't change. Which we talked about this on this video. If your paycheck doesn't change, but the prices go up, well, you're falling behind. That's why it's good to get that adjustment, which is why I told y'all to ask for a raise. It hurts people that are saving money in non-interest bearing. You, know, you take the money, you stick it in your under your mattress, and you put it in a jar and bury it in the backyard or something like that. That money's just losing value. 
uh, putting money in a savings account is losing value, but not as bad. Um, and overall, it helps borrowers and hurts lenders. We talked about that the other day, how Haley was lending me money to buy Sundrop, and then I was paying her back money to was could buy as many sun drops. And so that's why she charged me interest. And then she just shot me a week because she apparently wasn't satisfied with the interest rate. Right? Okay. So uh, if the inflation is cost push, if the inflation, the reason prices are going up is because it's harder for business to do business, then what's gonna happen? Businesses are gonna do less. So guess what? They need less workers. Because the price of Wheat and sugar and vanilla extract goes up. That means it's going to cost the bakery more to bake a cake, which means they're going to be selling their cake for more money. And what are we going to do? Buy less cake. So if they can sell less cakes, they're going to be let go bakers, right? So if it's cost push inflation, you're going to get that high unemployment. Um, but it should lead to an increase in the nominal wages for those who keep their jobs. Because if you keep your job, okay then you at least need to have that conversation with your boss about, I need to pay raise at least equal to the inflation rate. So hopefully you'll end up with an increase in real wages that just benefits. So if you want to protect yourself from inflation, well, what the second one is what Haley, well, Haley could have done is have an adjustable interest rate. If prices go up, she wants to make sure that she's going to give you enough money to buy 100 cans of sun drop. She wants to make sure that no matter what happens, I'm going to give her back more than enough money to buy 100 cans of sun drop. So she could say, well, if prices go up by 2%, well, you pay me 2% interest. If prices go up by 5%, you pay me 5% interest. If prices go up by 20%, you pay me 20% interest. Because that, no matter what, I want enough money to give my 100 cans of soda. Right? That is what an adjustable rate mortgage is. It protects the lenders because they guarantee that they're going to get enough money back, the purchasing power of the money they're going to get back is going to cover what happens to inflation. So generally, interest rates are going to be a little bit above the inflation rate. The inflation rate is 2%, is so the prime, you've heard of the prime rate. It's prime interest rate, LIBOR, does that ring a bill in you? Maybe we all have to talk about that in accounting class. You don't know because accounting is voodoo, right? You tell me you don't pay attention to that class and all this. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about ready to give you bonus points, but no, you said exactly the wrong thing. But anyway, but like if the inflation rate is like 2%, well then interest rates may be like 5%. So the 5% the that you're paying back to the bank, two of it is to cover inflation, and three of it is to cover their expenses. Right. But then if interest rates goes up to 8%, I mean, the inflation rate was 8%, well, it'd be 8% plus their 3% markup, they would be charging 11% for that loan. That's an adjustable rate mortgage. Um, okay, I'm going to stick with that one for a minute. Um, for the fun of it. Um, we had this thing called a 228. You don't need to know this for the test. It's just a little bit of history here. Um, the first two years of a loan is a fixed rate, it doesn't change, and this usually is a low teaser rate to get you in. And then the last 28 years of your mortgage is a purely adjustable rate thing. I don't have it all my So, what happened is A lot of the loan, a lot of loans, people, you, you buy a house and you, people will like, ooh, interest rates are better, so let me refinance. Or what happened for a lot of people in 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah, interest rates were lower, let me refinance. But also what was happening for people is, crap, I got a bunch of credit card debt. And these credit cards want me to pay 18% interest. But meanwhile, I bought this $100,000 house, took out a $100,000 loan on a $100,000 house, and now this house is worth like 150. So what I'll do is I will refinance the house. I'll get a new loan, a $150,000 loan for this house, get my 150, pay off my first $100,000 house, that loan. And then I've got $50,000 left that I can pay off my credit cards, pay off my car payment, pay off all that kind of stuff, get financially sound, so then I can go forward and I only have to make one payment that isn't this low interest rate. 
And then that's where this 28 r was so beautiful because it was really low for those first two years. Because the goal of this for the refinancing people is to give you two years to clean up all of your financial voodoo so then you won't get in trouble in the future and then life happens. So the guy ended up swallowing 200 in debt? No, because the first thing, he has to pay off that 100 with a new loan. They won't give you the this new loan without paying off the old. So he, he had a $100,000 loan, he replaced it with a $50,000, I mean $150,000 loan. Because he bought the house for, he bought the house for 100. But the house is worth 150, so he's using that 150,000 dollars house as collateral. He only needed 100 for it, but he ended up getting 150 loan. So that's the stuff that was going on in the financial industry. Because mortgage rates were, interest rates were very low. Because well, we kind of had the September 11th happen, and then people weren't buying and selling, so the interest rates got historically low. And so interest rates were cheap, so a bunch of people were like, dude, I'm going to refinance and clean up my finances. And then other people were like, well, you know, I'm going to buy it. My housing prices are going up because people are buying houses because they can get the loans really cheap. So then the you had people buying these houses. They're like, I'll go buy a house whether I need it or not because if I buy this, spend $100,000 on this house, two years from now it's going to be worth one hundred thirty dollars or one hundred fifty, dollars and I turn around and sell it. And I'll make a quick thirty or fifty thousand dollars, assuming I had a hundred thousand, a good enough credit to get the hundred thousand dollar loan in the first place. If I can make that payment, boom! Especially if I can get this cheap rate. What ended up happening? Generally speaking, when you get a loan, you pay off each month. Your payment is paying off all the interest that loan has accumulated for the month, and then anything that's left is going to go paying off the principal. Plus for the next one. Yeah, well, so we're paying off the, the, the $100,000 you owe. Uh, but during that month, you may have a $400, you have a $600 month house payment. Um, and, but during the, the, that month, before you make that payment, that $100,000 that you owe earned $500 worth of interest. So that $600 payment. It's paying five hundred dollars worth of interest, and then that remaining one hundred goes toward that hundred thousand dollar loan. So now you only owe nine thousand or ninety nine thousand nine hundred. Right? It takes a while to trim it down. Problem: What happened? Especially these adjustable rate mortgages and stuff. After the two years ended up being over, you had people whose house payment doubled. Because here's the dirty little thing: you have to pay the interest at least every month. You have to. Or they're not going to lend you the money because otherwise why have to lend you the money and then you're falling farther and farther and farther behind? Okay, Haley agreed to pay me a hundred thousand uh, dollars a hundred dollars. She's gonna lend me a hundred dollars. But suddenly now I owe her a hundred and one, a hundred and two, a hundred and five, hundred and ten. She's like, I don't think so. I only want plan on lending you a hundred. I ain't in for this lending you suddenly you owe me a hundred ten, hundred fifty, hundred show me the money. All right. Am I right? Yeah, she's already out here to show me one. So, what ended up happening is you had all these people up. I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to turn around and sell it in a couple of years and make a bunch of money. Well, what ended up happening is house prices went so high, demand increased way faster than it should have. Once interest rates started going up, people slowed down buying houses. So, suddenly, I bought this house for 100 thinking I could sell it for 130 Well, I can't find a buyer. I can't find a buyer, oh snap, and now, boom, I'm desperate because suddenly my that house payment on that loan doubled and I can't afford to make this payment. And so that's what that financial crisis, that was the starting of the financial crisis in 2008. <coughs> because interest rates finally started going back to normal territory because the economy started recovering, inflation started happening again, just like what we've got now. The economy got to moving again, so interest rates got to creeping up. So people were like, ooh, it costs me more to buy a house. People aren't buying as many houses. So the demand for houses went back to the left. So when demand shifts back to the left, price goes down. And the price goes down, the people were stuck with houses. Yeah, I can't refinance. Oh, crap. Yeah, let me refinance it so I can pay off the bid. The house isn't worth enough. I have a $100,000 house that's now only worth ninety. 
So I cannot redo a new loan in order to clean up that because I won't get enough money to pay off the hundred thousand because it's only worth ninety thousand. So that's where a lot, a lot of that flat set up being. So that was just a little bit of history in case any of you were here. So they could pay you. So instead of you paying six hundred dollars, I thought you said for the first two years they won't charge you interest. No, they charge you interest, but it's a low rate. It was like two percent, three percent, something like that. But then once that two years was over, your interest rate automatically changes to whatever the going rate is. After that may have been five or six, which ultimately resulted in a doubling of people's house payments. So that six hundred dollar payment suddenly became a twelve hundred dollar payment. And people there's a lot of people that couldn't afford it. Because they were just assuming that the houses were gonna just keep increasing value. They assumed it was going to have it, just like investors nowadays. They assume that stock markets can keep growing, growing, growing. But we've had to learn in the last couple of weeks they don't work that way. You cannot assume that it's going to keep going. But anyway, that's just a little bit of history. But just for a mortgage protects Haley, so she knows the money that I'm going to pay her back is going to be more than enough to buy her a hundred cans of sun drop. Right. The other thing is the cost of living adjustment that I talked about. That's giving you pay raise each year equal to the inflation rates. So that's to protect you workers. You should do that. So for that RA and having the interest rate, say she lends you hundred dollars on the interest rate, and yeah. oh, for the adjustable rate mortgage, if interest rates go down, well then my payment should go down. But so if interest rates go from three percent down to two percent, well then I only pay your three percent interest this year instead of her. So you end up but but she's okay because she's still going to get more than enough money from me to buy 100 cans of sun drop. Just the sun drops aren't getting as expensive, or then she's not going to need as much money. There I go. So, get it, when would you want an adjustable rate mortgage? As a lender, you want it if interest rates are low, in case they go higher, you're protected. As a borrower, when do you want them? In case interest rates are high and you think you're going to get lower, well, I got to pay now, but I'm hoping it's going to get better in the future. If you think, if you think interest rates will be going up in the future, try to get a fixed interest rate loan, so you know what to get, you know what to expect over the next thirty years. Because look, interest rates have been really low these last few years, and they still are pretty darn low. So if you'll be buying a house, I don't know, this year, next year, get a fixed rate loan and don't even think about it because it ain't going to get any better than it is right now. I'm just warning you now. <laughs> Well, I'm making the same thing for a car. A car costs and that interest rate is two percent. And if you well, uh, well, it's, well, it could be higher than that for a car, but okay. Well, so say yeah. Okay. That was messy. Interest rate goes up, you end up paying more monthly payment. Yes, but you get true as far as math, but you will not get an adjustable rate loan for a car. Because A, cars lose value anyway, and B, it's a relatively short term loan. It's only five, six, seven years. So they, they don't use up for rates on it. Uh, which is sort of consequently why the interest rate on a car loan is higher than the interest rate on a home loan, because a home is going to last a whole lot longer and no longer stability in what's going on. It's to the federal. And they said your interest rates can be anywhere from here. To even like thirteen something was the lowest one. Yeah, that was the, like that was the lowest. Sure. And when was it? Uh, this past year. Yeah. Was, was this some kind of like unsecured little loan that you was getting the build shop in the backyard kind of thing? That was for vehicle. It was for a car. Wow, that's actually pretty high. That was the lowest one to do. Great, you just posted like. Do better. Yeah. 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 I don't know why, but that was the lowest that they would offer to how they like that. So, by nature, sure. leadership. Okay. That's hard. Okay. Uh, price stability. That's the idea of it. Doesn't mean no inflation whatsoever, but it means there's no big changes. The prices are going to sort of steadily, slowly, because they are going to be steadily, slowly going, going up. Because we always had this pressure on demand because we're having more and more people this year than last. So. Price stability is predictable. That's really what it means. It doesn't mean flat. The price today is going to be the same as it was 10 years ago. It's the same as it was 50. No, but it's 
no, no huge changes, no huge swings. It's officially defined as less than 3%. And the Federal Reserve that we'll talk to on the monetary policy chapter if we ever get to it, uh, is the idea that they're, what, this is one of the couple things that they target is the inflation rate. They want to keep it less than 3% because if it gets too high, then you can end up having, you know, people aren't going to be borrowing money, so then there's going to be jobs up. You know, businesses aren't going to be borrowing to buy new equipment, so people are going to lose their jobs and that kind of stuff. So we want to keep it low. So if the unemployment, if the interest rate, if the interest rate is going above 3%, I mean, the inflation rate is going below 3%, they're going to be like, well, okay, we need to slow things down a little bit before we start having this problem. So they want to maintain price stability. Well, one thing they do is the government can adjust how much they're going to spend on things. But, okay, we think prices are too high, interest rates are too high, there's too many people borrowing so much money, they're competing to borrow the money, and that kind of stuff, so interest rates are high. So let's, if we don't buy as much, then that's going to slow down demand and that's going to lower prices. If we're, we, the government, are borrowing as much money, then we're not going to be competing with as much, other people as much to be borrowing money, so that's going to slow down interest rates. As changing their government spending, messing with interest rates, we'll get into way more detail on that in the next couple of chapters. So, okay. But of course, the government messing with this is, well, that economic efficiency goal from the first week of class kind of goes against how. Okay. No, that's actually the hardest one. The easiest one to do is just to do a tweak of the interest rate. But it's short, it's quick, but it's small. It, it, the example here is that's the adjustment that your cruise control does on the car once you've got it set. It's just speed up a little bit, slows you down a little bit. Well, government spending is going to be more of the your foot on the gas, your foot on the brakes, where the tax rate is more shifting gears, slowing forward, reverse, park. It takes take literally an act of Congress to make that one happen. happen. So mostly just park. Yeah. 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 Or like down hill and then you go to the park and watch transmission go out. I'll go to the government. Then the next week, next few weeks, government shut down, going to country year. Anyway, uh, guess where I'm going right here? Nominal and real. Same thing. Nominal interest rate, this is the interest rate that you're going to see the sign on the front of the bank, where the real interest rate is going to be when you adjust for inflation. The math is slightly different here. This is that math I told you that Haley lends me $100. She charges me 5% interest, but the inflation rate is 2%. So she gives me $100. I give her 105 back. The hundred dollars she gave me was enough to buy a hundred cans of sun drop. But the hundred and five I give her back, it ain't enough to buy a hundred five cans of sun drop because sun drop got a little more expensive. Right. That was enough money for her to buy a hundred and three cans of sun drop. Because of the inflation rate. Okay, so it would take uh, for me when I pay her back next year, it's gonna take her hundred and two dollars to buy a hundred cans of sun drop, right? And then she's going to have three dollars left because she can buy almost three more cans, right? So she can't buy a hundred or something because the price went up. So that's going to be the difference. And that's why when Haley lends me money right off the bat, she's going to figure out well, what do I think the inflation rate is going to be, and then I'm going to charge you a little something on top of that because this is to make sure I went from having enough to buy a hundred to having enough to buy a hundred, and then this. Is to make up for her pain and anguish, and whatever, about wishing she had the money and worrying about whether I skipped down or gone to Rio or something like that. All right. So Haley is gonna lend me money, and she's gonna say two, three percent there, and then because she doesn't trust me, she doesn't like me because I think accounting is voodoo, she's gonna think that I'm gonna be so that should be twelve percent. So I'm gonna have to pay a fifteen percent loan there. All right. But if she trusts somebody like Dr. Roberts, the president of the college, that she didn't know his name, right? But she, do you think he would be able to pay you back? Do you trust him? Yeah, so 2% worth of interest rate, uh, worth, worth to cover inflation, and maybe a couple percent to cover her anguish. 
So she only charged him for a percentage of trade, right? Where she charged you 14 or 18 or whatever that number was. But it starts with what is the inflation rate, and then you subtract out. Oh. Yeah, and then you subtract out the inflation from the nominal interest rate. So what's she really doing? She's getting 5% more dollars from me, right? But she's really only getting 3% more soda from me, right? That's why it's real interest rate. Because we're talking sodas. Just like when we were talking about real income, real wages for Jenny, we were talking soda. Dr. Pepper. Don't, don't worry. The thing about the number on the front of the paycheck is about how many sodas am I giving? Right. Uh, is it street, um, isn't it better for you charging less nominal interest for you to pay them if you don't have enough? Then charge you a lot if she doesn't trust you. Um, no, I, just, I would have to pay that. Okay, I'm going to skip that chapter and come back. Because here's the thing, if Palin, if I'm standing here and Dr. Roberts is standing here, and I say I'd like to borrow $100, and Dr. Roberts says I'd like to borrow $100, who's she going to, and she, she pulls out her wallet, she only has $100. Who are you going to lend that money to? Him. Because she trusts him. She trusts that he would be able to pay her back. She knows that I'm married. She knows that I'm, well, Dr. Roberts is married too, but she knows that I'm broke. She knows that this is my wallet. So, she's going to say, okay, Dr. Roberts, I'll lend it to you for 4%. So, what do I have to do? I got to no, 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 no. Will you lend it to me instead? She would say, no. Well, how about, would you lend it to me for 5%? She would say, no. Well, how about 6%? She would say, no. 7, 8, 9, until I finally. And willing to pay an interest rate to where she's willing to take the risk on me. The more risky that I am, the higher the interest rate I'm going to have to charge. I'm going to have to pay. And that's the way, exactly the way banks do it. The less likely you are to pay them back, the higher the interest rate they're going to charge to cover their risk, to cover its risk board. Why do you buy a lottery ticket? I'm going to. Get paid dollars, so I've got a one in a million chance to win two dollars. I don't know. Wouldn't that, nobody would buy that lottery ticket, right? That's just throwing away a dollar. But why do people throw away a dollar? Well, if I got a one in a million chance of winning one point six billion dollars, yeah, I'll throw away that dollar. What are your odds of winning? You ain't gonna win, right? But you're okay with it because well, if you do win, that payoff is like woo hoo. You're willing to take the risk of giving up that dollar. For the possible $1.6 billion payoff, but you ain't gonna risk that dollar to only win the two dollars in return, maybe. Right. So that's what ends up happening. So the less likely you are to pay them back, the higher the interest rate you're gonna have to end up paying. And that's the and that's the one thing where the financial system is bent, but it isn't bent. Because who are the people who are paying the higher interest rates? The people that can least afford to pay the higher interest rates, the people that are already financially struggle. Are the ones that are getting to, having to pay the high interest rates, where if the rich folk that ain't struggling, they don't have to pay a high interest rate. Well, but it, from Haley's point of view, she's got to protect herself. Why is she going to risk giving the money to me and taking the risk of me taking off to somewhere else with her money instead of paying her back? Because if I do pay her back, I'm going to pay her back a bunch. Right? Otherwise, no, she's going to lend it to somebody like Dr. Art. So it's what she has to do. It's just it's good sound business for her.